Hey, everybody, welcome back to the Infuse Your Future podcast, where we bring together people and ideas who are making the world a better place. I'm your host, Dr. C. And today we have another great guest with us, Kristen Secor. She has a blog called World on Wheels blog. She's going to talk to us about accessible travel with people for people with disabilities. So without further ado, hi, Kristen. How are you? I'm great. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Well, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, who you are, what you do, and what you do in the world that infuses people with health and vitality and positive adventure. Yeah, so my name is Kristen. I was born with a rare form of muscular dystrophy, and it affects my breathing, so you may hear my ventilator. Um, It also affects my mobility my balance, strength, and endurance. So I do have some limited mobility, but when I'm out traveling and out of the house, I use a wheelchair or mobility scooter for balance purposes and energy purposes. And I, it's a progressive disease. So when I was younger, I had more abilities than I do now. And right now I'm pretty limited in what I can do, but I don't let that stop me from traveling. And one of the things I know as my abilities were worsening, I wanted to know, can I still travel? Can I still, what can I still do? Because that was such an important part of my life. And there really wasn't a lot of resources out there. So I decided to change that. And that's when I started my wheelchair accessible travel blog, World on Wheels blog. My goal is to help let people know that you can travel with a disability, even on a ventilator or with a wheelchair. And I want to give people the information and resources to help make their travels possible and their dreams a reality. And so that's really my goal. I do that not only through the posts on my blog, but I also organize accessible small group tours uh, because I think the planning of accessible travel can seem overwhelming at times. So my goal is to help take that stress away and to really give people the adventure and the travels that they want to pursue. I think that's amazing because I'm, I'm sure you know this, travel, there's just nothing that can replace it the amount of information that we get, the learning, the adventure, we just become more worldly the more we travel. And so I think what you're doing is great because, you know, fortunately, um, I don't have those types of disabilities and I can't imagine how difficult it must be if you do have those limitations, you know, to do the travel. So that's awesome. Yeah, it takes a lot of more planning and I uh, kind of problem solving in the moment, but it is possible and it is still worth it. Like you said, travel is an amazing thing. It helps us grow as people and it really is fulfilling as well. So what are the benefits that you have received yourself from travel? It has given me more confidence in myself and my identity. Uh, I always used to think that being different was a bad thing. Uh, I grew up in the 80s where a lot of people with disabilities were sent to institutions. So that was kind of the indirect message. And so it was something that I always tried to blend in with and try to minimize and really pretend like it wasn't there, even though I knew it was. Um, So now as an adult and through travel, it has made me more comfortable and who I am, and it has allowed me to see that I can problem solve, I can handle difficult situations when they arise, and that being different really is a blessing. It's a positive thing because you have a unique perspective on the world, and your uniqueness is really what makes you special rather than bad. Um, and where? what is the favorite place that you've traveled to? Oh, that is such a hard question. I would find something positive about every trip. I would say that probably my top two right now are Antarctica and Italy. 
Ooh. Now, why Antarctica and Italy? So, Antarctica, the wildlife was absolutely incredible. Uh, we saw penguins every day. We saw whales every day, both humpback and orca whales. And we saw seals and just all these types of, you know, animals and just the mountains and how quiet it is. It's uh, very peaceful while you're there. Um, and then Italy uh, is just uh, so somewhere that I always really, really wanted to travel to. And when I went, I went with my best friend and we had an incredible time. I really challenged myself on that trip. I had better mobility back then, so I was not using a wheelchair at the time. And my goal was to climb to the top of the Duomo in Florence and to get there. It's like 463 steps, which mm. that never been my friend. They have always been a bit of a nemesis uh, just because they've been so difficult. And so I trained at the gym for like a good year, year and a half before that trip. And my best friend said, okay, that's your goal. Let's do it. And God bless her. She's afraid of heights, but we did it. And we climbed up there and achieved that goal. So just doing something so challenging and overcoming those obstacles was really rewarding. Wow. I bet. So how many, how many countries have you traveled to? I've been to 20 countries so far and four different continents. And do you have a goal, a life goal? of? Yes. My goal is all seven continents by the, by the end of 2026. That's fabulous. I think I saw something on your website about a trip to Antarctica. Mm -hmm. Is that, yeah. you, have, you have an upcoming tour? Um, um so Antarctica was January of this past year, um, so January 2023. Uh, but next year, I will be doing those tours I talked about. We will be going to Peru in March, to Machu Picchu. And then in September, we will be going to Africa. Oh, that sounds amazing. Peru and Africa. Um, when you go to Africa, do you know which country you're going to visit? I am visiting two countries um, for my tour with my readers. We will be going to South Africa on a safari. And then afterwards, I am going to be researching accessibility in Uganda and doing a gorilla trek. That sounds amazing. One of my really good friends is from Uganda. Oh, that's awesome. So I'm kind of used to hearing that that word in the in the realm of travel. So who do you, um, who should apply for your tour? Who should book your tour with you? So they're open to everyone. Uh, they are specially designed though for people with mobility problems, whether you're a wheelchair user or a slow walker or just have, you know, energy issues. Um, we try to make them as accessible as possible. And, but we know that, you know, people with mobility issues may have able-bodied friends or family that they want to travel with. So again, these tours are open to anyone who wants to join. Um, again, because I want to include anyone who wants to go to these wonderful bucket list destinations. That sounds fun. How big are your groups? Do you do you ever get sold out? Yeah, so Peru is sold out currently. Um, and that one's going to be about nine people. South Africa is a little bigger. There's going to be about 13 of us. That we uh, are pending being sold out. Uh, I have some people there just waiting to hear back, but there may be a room open. So if they can't join for whatever reason, so feel free to you know keep in touch with me, sign up to my newsletter for the latest updates. I am currently planning trips for 2025 um, for small group tours there so if you have a request of a destination you want to go to you can let me know um, and I have some ideas in mind too that are going to be pretty cool but I'm finalizing details on those right now that sounds amazing how many of these tours have you done already so next year is the first year that I'm actually have them organized it's something 
that has been a latest project for me because one, I think just the planning of accessible travel, because there is so much more involved than traditional travel can be overwhelming, but also accessible travel costs uh, anywhere from two to three times the price of traditional travel, which makes it a challenge for a lot of people. So my goal with the small group tours is to make it more affordable. If you can take that same tour that normally you would do privately and split the cost amongst more people, it becomes much more attainable. Right, right. And I would imagine that there's a lot of nonprofit groups out there that perhaps could partner with businesses like yours to kind of help people afford these trips that normally wouldn't be able to. So unfortunately, that's something I looked into recently for I'm doing a, an online accessible travel summit that will be completed by the time this airs. But it's basically a resource for people who need that information. And one of the presentations I'm doing there is how to afford accessible travel and making it more affordable. So I was looking into what kind of grants are available. And unfortunately, there's really nothing in the U.S. There's um, there's two organizations. There's for children, the Make-A-Wish Foundation, which grants travel to kids with you know illness. And then one of my fellow uh, wheelchair accessible travel bloggers started a nonprofit called the Curb Free Foundation, which awards a travel grant to participants each year, but it's pretty limited. Um, but those are the only two things for U.S. citizens. The U.K. has a couple more options, but it's more respite care rather than travel. Uh, so that's one area that really could use some improving. I think if there's ways you can save money in your everyday life, because A, who doesn't want to save money? Um, but setting aside some of that money you save can then go towards travel. So that's more of what my presentation is going to focus on, is how can we save, reduce the cost? How can you um, save money on travel and everyday expenses? That sounds fantastic. How old were you when you did your first trip? So when I was younger, we always went on family vacations, uh, always in the U.S. Uh, my mom was a single parent, so we had limited funds, but we made the most out of what we did have. And so I think that's where part of my budget consciousness comes from is growing up that way. My first international trip was in 2005, right after I graduated from grad school. Um, and I went with a friend to the UK, England, and Scotland, and absolutely fell in love with international travel and caught the travel bug and have been traveling ever since. Yeah, that's awesome. I love travel. I don't do enough of it myself. So what else would you like the listeners to know? So I just want people to know that accessible travel, yes, you have to plan in advance, especially to get accessible hotel rooms. You've got to then call and reconfirm to get that you're getting the actual room you booked, uh, that it's actually mobility accessible and not hearing accessible because they don't always make that distinction. Um, if you're wanting to cruise, you have to book early to get that accessible cabin because they're limited. Uh, so there is a lot of extra planning, but it is so worth it. It is so rewarding. And there are resources available. So if you find that stressful, if you want to have support, you know, blogs like mine are a great way to get information on what you can do, what's accessible, what things look like, because every everyone's abilities are different, even if you have the same diagnosis. Where you are in that journey may be different, and what you can handle may be different. So really knowing yourself is important to make accessible travel uh, successful. Uh, the more you know yourself and your abilities and what you're willing to handle, 
in terms of challenges and what ones you'd rather not take on is really important because that will help you choose what destinations are a better fit for you as well as what's out there and what resources may be helpful. Um, I'm curious, uh, you seem like a really incredible person because there are so many people out there with disabilities of different levels. And you're the first person that I've met who has taken this to the level of, I'm not gonna let this stop me. And not only am I, am I going to travel, but I'm gonna make this accessible for other people and I'm gonna have groups traveling with me. And so what do you think it was that made you want to go out in the world and do that? So I am a fairly stubborn or determined, however you want to word that person. It is a gene that runs in my family. We all have it. And I just apply that to my disability. And I really think that you have a couple of choices, right? You can't choose, you can't control that you have a disability. Sometimes that's just the cards that you're dealt with. But you can choose your reaction to it. So I could choose to be at home and, you know, just not follow the things that may be seen as risky or challenging, but then what would my quality of life be? And I think it's that piece that's important to remember. It's not just quantity of life, but it's quality and what brings you joy and what is that piece for you that makes you feel alive. Um, before I was more disabled, I was a mental health counselor for 11 years. So my natural instinct is to help others. That is something that fulfills me. It uh, gives me purpose. You know, that's one of the ways that I've made sense out of my disability is that I was given these challenges so that I can help others, whether they are disabled, whether they have different challenges. I have a unique perspective and understanding that I can use to make an impact on the world around me. And that was really important to me. That's part of what adds to my quality of life. And when my disability progressed to the point that I wasn't able to do the mental health counseling anymore, I really looked at what other ways can I make an impact? What is important to me? What am I good at? And how can I share that gift with others and make a difference in others' lives? And that's where the blog came into the play and then the tours. And I'm just trying to expand from there because I think that, yes, one thing alone can make a difference, but I want to make the most impact. And if I know that I have the resources and the knowledge and the ability to do that, then I feel like that's part of why I was put on this earth is to help make a difference for others. I like what you said about quality of life because that's so important and I feel like we don't always talk about it. Yeah, I think that's important to our mental health, right? If we just focus on what we have to do every day, the nine to five, uh, you know, all these demands that are placed on us, we can burn out and we can get overwhelmed and our life just isn't as fulfilling. If we can find those things that bring us joy and find ways to work them into our everyday life, then our life is going to be so much more joyous and special because we have that component. Right. And I'm sorry, you might have already mentioned this, but what age were you when you were diagnosed? I was um, a baby. So they were oh, a baby. Yeah. So I was born with this um, diagnosis and they knew something was wrong when I was in the womb because I had not turned. I didn't have the strength to turn to you know, be birthed naturally. So I was a C-section birth, um, but they didn't know exactly what it was. And it wasn't until I was uh, experiencing delayed milestones, right? I wasn't walking when I was supposed to walk. I had speech problems because my muscles in my face weren't developed and I was you know, very hard to understand as a child. So I had a lot of therapies. I had speech therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, because fine motor skills were difficult. Basically, anything using your muscles was something I struggled with. And so I had access to those. And then my pediatrician 
referred me to a specialist at the muscular dystrophy um, clinic. And really, because even when I was a child growing up, because my condition is rare, it literally affects one in a million people. They didn't have the tools to be able to give me a proper diagnosis. So they knew I had muscular dystrophy. They didn't know what type. It really wasn't until I was in my late 20s when they did genetic testing, thanks to technology, that they were able to pinpoint the exact type that I had. I mean, I I feel like it's great that you had such support through all of that. People to help you just continue to improve throughout your life. I'm very blessed that my family has been so supportive. Uh, my mom, my dad, you know, my brother uh, have always you know, done their best to assist me and make sure I got the medical care I needed and have just been a huge support for me, not only with my health, but just with my passions and my dreams as well. I've been very blessed with that. And is that why you went into the mental health field? I went into that because I knew there were things I couldn't do and things I could. And so a lot of the physical challenges, I was never going to be an athlete, you know, to be perfectly honest, that was never a skill set that I had. And, you know, I've, some of the other occupations are limited because I can't lift um, a lot of weight. I can lift barely anyway. So I'm knowing what my limitations were but also what my abilities were. And so I may have a lot of physical limitations, but cognitively I'm all there. And I knew that I'm a great listener and I can work to help people problem solve based on what I've done in my own life. I can understand their challenges and really just provide that support to them. So that's one of the reasons I went to the mental health field is it was really using and acknowledging what my skill set was. Wow. Now, do you still counsel people? I do not. Um, so I do not have my license anymore. But what I do find is that I take a lot of the skills that I used as a counselor and now just apply them to travel. When someone is anxious about going on that flight or they're anxious about you know getting outside of their comfort zone, I can understand where they're coming from. I can hear not only what they're telling me, but what the underlying concern is. So I can help them better by addressing the, you know, providing the resources that they need because I understand not only what they're telling me their concerns are, but what the underlying stuff behind that is. So it helps me direct them. It helps me to the right resources that helped me kind of hold their hand and say, you know what, it's going to be okay. You have a right to feel anxious. It is a normal emotion and a normal feeling and it's valid. Let's find ways to help you work through that so that you can get to your goal of travel. Um, I always like to give people a call to action. Do you have a call to action for people out there? I would love for you to check out my website, World on Wheels Blogs subscribe to the newsletter. I send it out right now. It's twice a month. I give you travel tips. You're going to get the latest information on any tours I'm doing or any just accessibility news. And it's a great way that I connect with people. Um, so if you have questions, feel free to email me through that, you know, that email address because I really answer. And I really I enjoy getting to know people and helping them achieve their dreams. So please feel free to reach out, connect. I would love to meet you and to help you with your travel goals. That sounds amazing. And I'll definitely put all of your contact information in the show notes so that people can click on the link and um, kind of connect with you and sign up for one of your group tours. Although it sounds like they're pretty popular. If you're Machu Picchu is booked out, which I can totally understand. I haven't been there yet. That's on my bucket list. Um, now, are you going to go two different trips to Africa or one trip to two different countries? One trip to two different countries. The group trip is only to South Africa because 
I know that the accessibility is there. We're using a, a specialized company that specializes in accessibility to do the tour. Uh, Uganda, I'm exploring on my own so that I have that research and that information to then provide to my readers. You can follow my journey. I will be posting pictures of what the accessible rooms look like, what the challenges are and all of that. But I wanted to do that research first before I put people into that blindly. Um, and then, uh, like I said, 2025, I'm already planning those. I hope to announce those early next year. Um, so if you want to hear more about those, I have a couple of ideas of some really great places in Europe. Um, so yeah, stay tuned for that. Um, when someone signs up for your tour, uh, what is the usual investment? So I try to make it as affordable as possible. Uh, right now, between the average price between the Peru and the Africa trip is around $3,000 a person. However, that is pretty inclusive. That includes all of your lodging, all of the tours and admission prices, all of your transportation once you get there. So it does not include international flights, but it'll be airport transportation, uh, transportation while you're there to all the activities. And these are all adapted vehicles to accommodate wheelchairs um, and the activities themselves. I try to make sure at least breakfast is included. For Africa, there's a lot more meals included because sometimes we're going to be in more remote areas, like when we're in Kruger National Park. Um, so a lot of the meals for Africa are included as well. So I try to make it as inclusive as possible so you don't have added an extra cost when you get there. That's awesome. And how long is the trip usually? So Peru is uh, like eight or no, about 10 days. And then Africa is 13. So I try to keep it two weeks or less. I find that's what most people have available. Uh, so some of the trips for next year, we're looking more at like a week time frame, a little over. Um, I also do it that way because flights are difficult on us physically. And that way it gives us some time to a little bit of time to recoup and so that we're you know enjoying as much as we can while we're there you know well between flights wow i mean ballpark three thousand dollars for that that sounds like an unbelievable deal you know even I, if you don't have disabilities just international travel i mean those prices can add up fast they can and so next year i'm finalizing prices um i think one of the one of the countries that it's a possibility is switzerland which tends to be a more expensive destination anyway but my goal like i said is with this travel group is to you know split that cost so it's more affordable um so i really try to make that reasonable for people and you know something that's uh they can they can do so that they can go to these wonderful destinations. Yeah. I mean, this is amazing. I'm really glad that we got a chance to talk because it just really opens my mind as well. And I hope that your company goes viral because I think what you're doing is amazing. Well, thank you so much. I really hope that I'm being, you know, a, a really useful resource to people because that's what I get you know, that feeling that I get when I'm helping others is just amazing. And of course, I love traveling too. So I could talk all day about travel and journeys and, you know, like that with people. So uh, it's just, it's a wonderful experience. And I hope to make that not only for me, but for others as well. That's great. Well, I really enjoyed having you on the show. Um, and I wish you the best success. Thank you so much. Hey, everybody. Thanks for listening to this episode of the In Future Future podcast. Um, I think this is a great message for anybody out there, the importance of travel and that travel is accessible to whoever you are, even if you have what are considered to be significant disabilities by much of society. So 
Hope you do something positive with this. Help spread the word. Please share this with at least two other people to help us grow. In the meantime, take care and continue to infuse your future. Bye.